Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to have you here. I want to turn myself on here. I'm on the machine. There we go. We'll have to see how that works. Welcome. It's good to have all of you here. And uh, we sort of move into our summer rhythm. But just to reassure people, we're, we continue the same rhythm of services, 8.30 and 10.30 through the, through the summer. And also at Burgoyne's Cove on the second and fourth Sundays. So I know some churches have fewer services in the summer. We're just going to keep moving all the way through. And uh, thank you for all who gathered today. And uh, our service this morning is morning prayer from the book of Alternative Services. And so we'll bounce you around a little bit. But as long as you got the green prayer book and the bulletin, and I think we need to, oh, no, I think that's all you need. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. O oh, come, let us worship. Our opening hymn, The joy of the Lord is my strength. The words are in the bulletin. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. Lord God Almighty, 
And our canticle is from Ezekiel, once again in the bulletin, and we read it together. I will take you from the nations and gather you from every country and bring you home to your own land. I will pour clean water upon you and purify you from all the defilement and cleanse you out of your own Christ. A new heart I will give you and put a new spirit within you. I will take from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you walk in my ways and observe my decrees. You shall dwell in the land I gave to your forebears. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading from Genesis. Genesis, chapter 18, beginning at the first verse. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring you a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent of Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Now Abraham I'm just going to back up. I skipped over a part. <laughs> under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you, in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac 
to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter to me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed is in your bulletin. The congregation's response is in the bowl. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? With the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows in the pre to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And together, eternal God, God, faithful, faithful in your tender, tender compassion, give us, us hope for our life here and hereafter, through, through the, the victory of your only Son, when, when we share the cup of salvation. salvation Revive us now through joy of this everlasting gift. We ask this in his name. Amen. Please be seated. The New Testament reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. And in this, St. Peter reminds us that the way we gain access to God is through Christ. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Our gradual hymn is Blessed Assurance. You'll find the words in the bulletin. We stand together and sing and remain standing for the gospel reading that follows. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, 
Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the disciples, the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If, is, if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending out you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Speak in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there are very few things that are, well, there are lots of things, but one of the things that is quite difficult and quite awkward, I find, is when you end up laughing at a time when you're not supposed to. Particularly if you get that kind of urge to, to giggle a little bit at a time when it's just not called for. I remember one year at seminary at, at Theological College, every morning we would start with chapel and the students would take turns leading the chapel and this was toward the end of the term. And we had a little booklet of prayers that we followed, you know, through various prayer cycles. And on this particular day, what the booklet had was we were praying, what it actually said was this. We pray for the excommunicated, blot out their sins and offenses, and so on. A fine prayer, hardly find anything to argue with there. It had been a long term. We had a big exam that morning, I don't remember what it was, but all of us students were feeling the pressure of getting the papers done and studying for the exam and figuring out what was happening for the summer, so we were under a bit of stress. Well. It wasn't me, I, I won't take any credit for this or blame. But the giggle started near the beginning of the service. And we tried very hard to, and particularly the poor student leading the worship, to get it back under control. Because, you know, like you, you really can't like blow off the whole service. And he tried, and we tried, and we take a deep breath and, and go ahead, and we were doing fine, and then the prayers came, now, he read the prayer I read a minute ago. The problem was that there was, you had to turn the page in the middle of it. And, and he missed that. And so he sits there and he held up the book and he said, we pray for the excommunicated blot. <laughs> and you can imagine the impact on these poor people who were struggling 
to contain themselves. And, and we looked at them. And the principal, who was trying hard to be very serious and, and make sure that we were all had the appropriate decorum for the occasion, looked at the student. And the student looked at the book and read it again. And it was over. I mean, there was no coming back from it. We gave up. We struggled through a few more prayers, barely able to breathe, and went off to the exam. And then afterwards realized, okay, he needed to turn the page, but he didn't see that part. Well, there are lots of reasons that we laugh. Nervousness, exhaustion, I suspect they both played a role in that. And quite frankly, sometimes things are just funny. They're just so far outside of our range of expectations that we can't help but laugh how, at how ridiculous the thing we are seeing or hearing is. That's why infants laugh so much, right? I mean, my goodness, when you're eight months old, a ball lands on the floor and bounces. It's the silliest thing you've ever seen in your life. And, and that's why you laugh at it. To be honest with you, at 65, that one's worn a little thin. It doesn't make me laugh as much anymore. I will laugh at the eight-month-old ball. Well, the readings this week are full of ridiculous things. There's no other word for it, really. And I, I really like the, the passage in the line in the verse in the first hymn about laughter, because it really fits very nicely. The passage from the book of Genesis, and, and I say this every time it comes up, it's one of my favorites. And I'm going to reread parts of it and, 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 and remind us of what's happening here. The first thing, it's obvious that Abraham and Sarah must have been from small town Newfoundland. Because watch what they do, the first thing, when these strangers show up. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Then bring me a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may pass on since you've come to your servant. And then he says, Go off and make some little cakes and... And he tells her, go chop up one of those animals and put it on the barbecue. And, and, you know, that reminds me, you know, if, you guys know this. If you starved it at the Newfoundland, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> but they do just that. The men are asked in and they're fed a meal. And at no point in this does Abraham say, so who are you and why are you here? They're hungry. It's hot. Give them water. Give them food. What? There's no question about that. And he stands by them under the tree as they eat the meal that's been prepared. And after a while, perhaps once they've been eating the meal that they've prepared, they ask Abraham where his wife is. Where is your wife Sarah? And he says, they're in the tent. And then one of them said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah, and this is one of the parts I love, was listening at the tent entrance behind him. So she's like, she can't just... She's not going to miss what's going on, right? She's sitting there kind of peeking out the corner, trying to watch who these people are and what they're up to. Well, I'm going to show my bias, but I love the little details in this story. She wants to respect the tradition that says Abraham as the man would have met with the visitors, but she's too nosy. She's got to know what's going on. So she hides behind the flap of the tent and listens, listens in. Well, Abraham had been asked by God to leave the place where he had been living and go to this land that the Lord had promised him. And God also promised that he would be the founder of a great nation and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars above. And yet here she was, well past the age of childbearing age, and she hasn't had any children. And so she's like, I don't know how this is going to work. Well... I'll spare you the details. Read, read the rest of the story. It's heartbreaking in parts, and it's not all funny. Some of it is very difficult. But the story continues. Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? Now, that's, you, there's certain rivalry in that, you know, that I think is real. Um... The Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? And Sarah denies it, saying, I didn't laugh. 
I love that line. And he says, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Caught red-handed. I think I would have liked Sarah. She had a sense of the ridiculousness of what God was proposing. But it didn't stop her from being obedient to God's call. Well, the story doesn't, doesn't go into detail, but I kind of imagine the visitors laughing along with her and the silliness of the whole thing. And then the laughter carrying on through the day and the evening. And next thing you know, well, Isaac was conceived. And this is not described as a virgin birth of any sort. But she was willing to do what she needed to do, as was, was, was her husband. It was ridiculous. But they did it. And God honored that. The reading from Romans has one of those very odd arguments that Paul uses a few times when he argues from the greater to the lesser, the other way around. He says, I suppose someone might be willing to die for a good man. But you kind of get the impression he's saying it's not that likely. But they might. The implication being that nobody is going to die for someone who isn't good. For someone who's sinful. Someone who's, who's fallen. Someone who, who is not all that great. And that's what he's saying that God has done. God gave his son for us, not while we were wonderful, but when we were wrecks. And he's pointing out the difficulty of believing that. Because he says, I know, hold on, stay with me here, he says. You might do it for a good person, right? And yeah, maybe. And he says, okay, God did it for you guys. And he gets that that's ridiculous. That's, that's, that's... But God did it, and that's his point. In the Gospel reading, Jesus assembles this motley crew of people and sets them out on that work of building God's kingdom. You know, I've done a lot of courses when I was at the government of Alberta. <clears throat> Governments love to send people on courses. And I did a lot of courses on things like team building. And, and you know, and all the different skills and the different things you need. And But this is ridiculous. I mean, those disciples never knew what was going on. And every time Jesus says something or does something, they go, that was really great, Jesus, we like that. What did you mean? <laughs> that was, whenever they get him aside afterwards, they're going to say, that's a great parable, love that parable, I'm going to tell that one to my kids. I have no idea what it meant. And he has to explain it to them again. Because they heard it, but they missed the point. But those are the ones he picks. And he sends them out. He taught people, he taught them, and he sent them out to do this ministry. Even though, of course, they're not very good at it. They're not very good at much, frankly, in the Bible. But those are the ones that he calls. And he tells them, this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard work. Not everyone's going to like what you're telling them. Not everyone is, those are wolves out there. Don't kid yourself. Be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as doves. Don't panic when you get into hot water. When it comes time to testify, God will give you speech. People are not all going to like you when you do this, but don't give up. God's time will come before you ever get this done. Not, not a promising way to begin, is it? If they ask you, you know, we're going to start something new, we're going to just grab a bunch of random people who are, they don't understand it, they're not very good at much, they're going to run off the first sign there's any trouble. It still doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Jesus probably could have had a much better team if he did really worked at it. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but we might have had a better team here too if we Oh, you're wonderful. And this is the one exception of all the churches except for Irvine's Cove. This is the these are the two churches that are different. That are all wonderful people who understand everything. <laughs> See? It doesn't work that way, does it? It's not based on us understanding it all perfectly. That's the point in that, in both in the Romans reading and in the gospel reading. They're not a wonderful group of people who are brilliantly talented and deeply faithful and committed. And there are people who did the things that they thought God was calling them to do. And that's all they needed to be able to do. Can you imagine for a moment if we took that on here? 
look around and, and you know, God didn't send the disciples very far away. In fact, he said, stick close to home, start there. So you imagine if and he commissioned them to go out to preach, to teach, to heal. He told them to volunteer, don't expect to get much back for it. So where is God's love needed in this part of the world? In Clarenville, in Shoal Harbor, in, in, in Harcourt, in, in, in Burgoyne's Cove. Where are the people here who need to know more than they know now about God's love for them? Are there elderly people who are feeling lonely perhaps? Ignored? Are there young families who, who need to be welcomed into a new community or struggling, who, who need nurturing in the faith, who need some very basic things to get through? Are there people who need to understand that there actually is a point to this life we live? Are there newly arrived people, immigrants or refugees, who could use some support in adapting to a very different world? Are there people, I'm pretty sure there are, who need to know the good news that we have. And how do we bring it out to them? What if all of us here just found just one person over the course of the summer and found a way to tell them about God's love for them? Just one. You know, dozens, of maybe, but just one. Matthew says, it says in, in the Gospel, you know, don't worry about what to say. God will give you the words. We have God's promise that God will be with us. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. Like people say, like, I can't do that. Well, you're right, you can't. But God can. And that's why one of the challenges I think we face is it's difficult for us to believe that God can accomplish things. Most of us here are faithful enough. We attend church more or less regularly. Most of us here do our best to live a fairly good life. We hear about God's promises, but to accept that they're really meant for us, to trust that God can actually make a difference in our lives and the lives of those around us, that's a bridge too far for some of us. And one of the lessons to me in the readings are today is, it isn't actually. And they challenge us to trust that God will work in the ridiculous situations we find ourselves in. That God will, will work with what we have, however much we think, not much there. God will use that. And God has over and over again in the Bible. God has done it over and over in the church. God has done it over and over in our lives. All of you are here because of something somebody did or said in your life. So think about that a little bit. Perhaps one or two of you had some big dramatic event and some big brilliantly skilled person. I bet you it's not very many of us though. I bet you most of us, it was our nan, it was our, our mother, our father, it was a neighbor, it was an aunt, it was someone who lived on our street, you name it. But all of us here are here because of something an ordinary person did. And that's pretty wonderful. And we're ordinary people. And maybe we can do the same thing. We're called to trust in God's promises when they don't make sense. We're called to trust in God's promises even when we're pretty sure it's not going to work. Because when we do that, there will be surprises. Laugh all you want because they are ridiculous, then get to work. Amen. <laughs> On page 52 of the prayer books, you'll find the words for the Apostles' Creed. We stand together and affirm the faith we share. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with judges, living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our offertory hymn is in the bulletin, Jesus Saves. Now people are going to say, we've got a couple people who are going to say nice things about you. 
We searched and searched for some yeah. <laughs> 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 wow. Okay, Serious question, do you want to share? Okay. So we, we do this at the offertory because I think it really is, over the years, well, all of the people who offer the music here, that really is a wonderful offering to God of their talents uh, to, to, to the work in this place. Over to you, Sherry. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to acknowledge a person who is very important to all of us at St. Mary's. For 55 years, June Butler has volunteered her talents, time, dedication, and enthusiasm <clears throat> to this church and this congregation. We all acknowledge June's contribution as our longtime organist. However, she has given so much more to the life of St. Mary's. From maintaining senior, youth, and junior choirs, and there was even a time when we had over 40 young people in our junior and youth choirs. Putting off numerous Christmas pageants and Easter cantatas, organizing choir reunions, vacation Bible schools, and junior choir camps and exchanges, playing for weddings, funerals, and special services, and the list goes on. Now, it seems this morning that we've been talking, it's been a bit, a bit lighthearted, and we've been talking about funny things that have happened. And sometimes funny things happen when you don't intend for them to happen. You know, you think you're being very serious, and you think you're doing very well, but you're really not. <laughs> so I, I, want, I, I just want to tell you, a story. I wasn't going to mention this, but it's so funny. <laughs> I have to tell you. And it, at the time it wasn't funny, it was mortifying. But some of these stories, when you think about it after, you kind of can't stop laughing. I don't know if you're like, but it is. <laughs> so one day, several years ago, there was a special service at this church. I don't even remember what it was, but the bishop was here. At the time, June was, June was the organist in the choir, and I was trying to direct. And one of the, the jobs, I guess, that June had, or one of the things she tried to do, was teach me how to sing all the time. Other people do, but most of them do. So we thought we were doing very well, you know, trying to sing the alto. So anyway, during the service, we had this lady in our choir who had a fantastic voice. She was just beautiful. Vina Gould, if anybody remembers her. So Vina was singing an anthem. And the bishop was sitting there in his chair, and Vina was standing behind him. June and I were back by the organ. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was, oh, it was just gorgeous. So I don't know what made us decide to do this, but at the last, just before the last verse, somebody said, let's you and I sing the alto. And help, you know, help, uh, help find it out. She didn't need us to help her out. <laughs> but anyway, June and I chimed in on the last verse with the alto. Anyway, we thought we did a great job. So everything went fine. The service was over. <laughs> After um, June was talking to her son, Derek. It was Derek, Derek wasn't it? Was here. Derek was here today and probably remember saying this. Anyway, she said to uh, Derek, what did you think of the service? Oh, the service was lovely. How about the anthem? Oh, the anthem was beautiful, but why, oh why, did the bishop decide he was going to chime in on the last verse? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a funny moment now. It wasn't a funny moment then, Derek. <laughs> anyway, finally, June has made the decision to retire from regular organist duties. But that's not to say that we won't hear her soothing tunes from behind the organ on occasion. I hope we do. Yeah. June, we thank you for your dedicated service and we wish you and Butler much enjoyment in your retirement. And we do have a small present. Yeah.
have a little token of appreciation for June from all of us here at St. Mary's. This is from Vestry and all of the congregation. I think you should. Yes. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I think you should. Why would you do that? Doesn't matter. Don't open it. There is a card here too. That's for camping. That's for camping in her motor home. And it says, You are my sunshine. And it says, For June, with appreciation from St. Mary's Church, Farmville, June 2000. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so very, very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim. Much more to say. Thank you. Thank you again. There's so much I'd really like to say this morning, but my heart is so full. My eyes are so full as well with tears. That I should just say a simple thank you. But I don't think it's enough. I think I would be remiss if I didn't say that my years as organist has given me a lot of satisfaction, a lot of joy, and it has a lot to do with all the support of the others around me. My family first, the many rectors over the years, and this rector, and the many, many dedicated choir members who were always there for me no matter when I called them, if I called them on a five-minute notice, they were there uh, for so many funerals and other important occasions in the church. They always had my back, every one of them, and so I could never have done it without them. But I'm thinking today of one great man of 65 years ago, when I was just a young and eager child of 14, and I just love to sit in church in the choir on Sunday mornings and watch his fingers just glide over the organ keys. And that was in St. Paul's Church in Lewisport, where I spent my teenage years. He saw the desire, I guess, and he mentored and molded till he thought I was ready to sit and play Jesus Loves Me to the congregation. And he was there just guiding me along. He wasn't successful in teaching me the musical skills to be a professional by any stretch of the imagination, but I sometimes think that he gave me more than that. He gave me the desire to love and to put my heart and soul into every word of every hymn that I ever played in church. Uh, many an incorrect key or note had been played, I'm sure. But never, the passion was always, always there. And I'm sure that it's going to remain there until the day I die, I'm sure of that. All the years have special memories, and especially the one that Sherry just mentioned about the bishop at that time. Uh, but none are more special than 25 years that I spent with Sherry, uh, with the junior and the youth choirs. Uh, we work side by side together for, well, it's probably more than 25 years if we counted them all together. And uh, we, we just love them, she loves them, and I love them. And I owe her so much because she was such a support and such a help for me. I don't think I would have gotten through all those years without her. So thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. doing everything that I've done for my church, but now the time has come for me to take a more comfortable pew, as Pierre Burton would say, and savor the memories. And as Reverend Keith always, or almost always, ends his uh, sermons on Sunday morning, I say and I quote, and for all those years, I give thanks to my God. Thank you.
As I say, this is all part of what we offer to God, all of us here in our worship, in varying ways. So the prayer over the gifts you'll find in the bulletin. We pray together, God of reconciliation and forgiveness, the saving work of Christ has made our peace with you. May that work grow towards its perfection in all we offer you this day. We ask this in his name. Amen. When we move to our time of prayer, you may sit, stand, or kneel as you find most helpful. In the hymnal on page 112 is litany number three. And we will get to that in sequence. Let us pray for Justin, our Archbishop, Linda, our Primate, Chris, our National Indigenous Bishop, David, our Metropolitan. In the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Australia. In the Tridiocesan Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the parish of Isla Martz, Deacon in Charge, the Reverend Deacon Herbert Park, Congregations of St. Augustine, Fox Bruce, Marguerite, the Holy Spirit, Isla Martz. The parish of Pasadena, Cormac, priest in charge, the Reverend Chris Goss, congregations of St. David of Wales, Pasadena, St. George of England, Cormac. God of salvation who sent your son to seek out and save what is lost, hear our prayers. On behalf of those who are lost in our day, receiving these petitions and thanksgivings with unending compassion. <coughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this Father's Day celebration. Give them wisdom and insight in raising their children and give us moments today reflecting on our fathers. Heavenly Father, protect the areas of this land that are under drought and fires. Nurture and encourage a growing season. And even though our growing season is late, may we receive a harvest plentiful for our needs. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in this season for teachers and schools which are doing their wind down. May the students and teachers receive a needed break and use their time well to be refreshed for their studies in the fall. Almighty God, giver of all good gifts, look on your church with grace. We have throughout our diocese vacancies, and we give thanks for Reverend Keith's service and our own upcoming vacancy. We ask that you guide the minds of those who shall choose replacements throughout the diocese.
that they may receive a faithful servant who will care for your people and support us in our ministries through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us offer our prayers to the source of all love and life, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray for all who call themselves Christians, that they may become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to the praise of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for John, our bishop, Reverend Keith, our priest, Terry, our archdeacon, and those who minister in the parish, and for all bishops and other ministers, that they may remain faithful to their calling and rightly proclaim the word of truth. We pray for Charles, our king, for the leaders of the nations. For Justin, our Prime Minister, Andrew, our Premier, John, our Mayor. And all in authority, that your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives. We pray for Clarenville and those who live here poor and the rich, elderly and the young men and women, that you will show your goodwill to all. Lord, we pray for the victims of our society and those who minister to them, that you will be their help and defense. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring before you the needs of Dale, Alec, Pamela, John, Pauline, Edna, Hilda, Paul, Mary, Eddie, Verdina, Danette, Brian, Neil, those we name now, those we name in our hearts and those known only to you. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring before you the needs of the King family in their time of grief. Be with them that they may journey with you. We pray for those who are, who have been confirmed, confirming their baptism, that they may be strengthened in the faith. Lord, we give thanks for all the saints who have found favor in your sight from the earliest times, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and those whose names are known to you alone. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful witnesses. Lord, Lord, Redeeming sustainer, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make you welcome not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. Amen. Amen. And find the collect the prayer for this week in the bulletin. We pray together, Almighty God, Without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. We have just a couple announcements. First is that uh, Vestry, our parish board, will meet tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock in the hall downstairs. And uh, that's for those of you who are involved, uh, that's on. There is some information at the back about the diocesan children's camp, which is July 24th to 28th. I believe it's ages 8 to 14, but we can verify that on the form. Please pass that along to anyone you know of who might be interested. And uh, there is, if, if finances are an issue, there are some funds available to help people go if they're unable to otherwise. So those forms are at the back, so if you have any kids or grandchildren or neighbors or friends or whatever you think might be interested in that, please, please let them know. And okay, there's some forms there, and there's more available online if you need. If you have any questions, I won't necessarily know the answers, but I can get the answers. And that's up at Max Sims Camp, which is on the, just down the Baby Spear Highway. Choir practice, uh, Thursday morning. Uh, for next week's service. That'll be Thursday at 10.30, I think, usually. That's when it is. That's on this week. One final thing that isn't in the bulletin, and you might have noticed, and it was pretty hard to miss when I came to read the Gospel, our PA system, uh, it's been kind of crackly for a while, and then about a month ago, the machine that's in the choir room toasted itself. And I mean that quite literally. You couldn't put your hand on it. Something that shorted out and it was so hot you could bear it, it's dead. So we've been jury rigging the thing that we're using this morning, which obviously needs a little more adjustment. It also is not able to run the hearing assist system. It doesn't have the correct outputs for that. It's also, as it happens, not the time of year when our parish is flush with funds. And so it's a bit of a challenge, but I would suggest if people would like to, it would be good to get it working properly. But there's probably somewhere seven, eight hundred dollar range of money that is needed to do that. It's in that ballpark to do it up, to do it right, make sure those speakers are working, make sure the system is working properly. If you would like to contribute to that, please do so. Make, make it on your on your envelope, on your check. I would suggest that that not be instead of or in addition to whatever you normally offer. We're not asking people to stop giving to like the light bill and and because and it's not going to work without electricity, whatever we get. Anyway, something for your consideration and thoughts. We're hoping to do that relatively quickly. I can make a lot of volume, uh, but even so, for some of the folks who have hearing challenges, it's a little difficult. And you might, you might get a very quiet rector next. And if you get a quiet rector, they, they're going to need that. So in any case, for your consideration, for your thoughts and prayers, we're hoping to move relatively quickly on that if we're able to. That's really up to the folks who are going to help make that happen. So anything else I forgot in terms of announcements? Thanks to Bob for the music. Yeah. You're not retiring, so you don't get you don't get a quilt yet. <laughs> but you know, I, it, it is a wonderful thing that, that sometimes it's a challenge on a given week to find who's going to do what. But we have a, we're very fortunate here to have lots of folk and lots of styles of music. So thank you for that. So we'll stand for the blessing and then our final hymn. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, We Are Children of the Lord. We are children of the Lord, sons and daughters of the Lord. We are children of the Lord, and we want to walk in God's way. And we want to live in God, and say, Begins.